Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first seminar of the Italian Reproducibility Network. We are very happy to resume this uh, series of seminar, which uh, started in uh, uh, 2020, so we are very excited to start this new year, and we are also very happy to have you here uh, to attend and hopefully to join our uh, our, our seminar. Um, so the first thing I would uh, I would like to do is to thank uh, the um, Italian Association of Psychology uh, to let us uh, use this uh, Zoom platform for. Uh, yeah, to do our uh, our seminars, so thank you very much to them. And uh, uh, ETRN is an association that uh, spread awareness about uh, reproducibility and replicability crisis and uh, try to uh, promote uh, open science through a lot of initiatives uh, like, like this one, like the open online seminars about uh, open science. And if you want to support the Italian Reproducibility Network, you can think about becoming a member uh, by subscribing to, uh, to the association. And uh, also, if you want to uh, keep updated with our uh, initiatives, you can check uh, our website and also our YouTube, ch uh, YouTube channel where you can find, uh, uh, for example, also the registration of uh, uh, past uh, seminars. And uh, if you get there, please also subscribe to the channel. <laughs> so we get more follower and spread the good words uh, uh, to many people. Um, uh, before starting with the seminar, let me uh, say um, about uh, some uh, information about the, the question and uh, answer session, which will be uh, after the uh, uh, the, um, the 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 introduction, the speak of the speaker. And uh, if you have a question, please, uh, you, if you want to ask a question, you can uh, send it in the chat, and we can uh, uh, read it out loud for you. Or if you have a question, also you can raise your and just uh, speak up for yourself. And uh, if you uh, are a PhD student, please uh, signal this uh, to us so we can uh, give a priority to your questions. So let's start with today's seminar and let me introduce first uh, our speaker of today, which is who is uh, uh, Charlotte, Dr. Charlotte Pennington, uh, which uh, will uh, speak about the student's guide uh, to open science. Uh, Dr. Charlotte Pennington is a lecturer in uh, psychology and a fellow of uh, Higher Education Academy at Ashton University in Birmingham. She's an experimental social psychology interested in how people complex uh, social environments impact uh, upon health uh, and well-being. Uh, one of them of her research focuses uh, on the psychological processes that influence addictive behaviors. The other focuses on how social cognition develops and is altered through health and disease. Charlotte is also an expert of open science. She's in Aston uh, Local Network Lead for the UK Reproducibility Network, a member of the Framework for Open and Reproducible, uh, Reproducible Research Training, and an action editor for registered reports at Addiction Research and Theory, Peer Community in. And uh, she's uh, the author of A Student's Guide to Open Science, Using the Replication Crisis to Reform Psychology. So you're very welcome, Charlotte, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you for inviting me today. So I'm just going to share my screen just to let you know that I won't be able to see you as I present. So if anything goes wrong, please raise your hand and I'll come back to the screen where I can see everybody. So hopefully you can see my slides now in full screen. Could someone maybe just say yes? Not yet. Not yet. Let me, sorry, that's my fault, I think. Let's try again. Yes. There we go. How about now? That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. So thank you again for having me today. Um, my talk is going to talk about a guide to open science. And I want this to be a very accessible talk where you can answer, where you can ask any questions that you might have about open science and hear from me and my experiences 
of a PhD student who went through the replication crisis and then learned about open science at the end of my PhD and actually now implement a lot of these principles and practices into my everyday research, but also training uh, new PhD students and research assistants, as well as undergraduate students in open science as well. So I've called this talk a student's guide to open science, but what I actually mean by student here is everybody. So open science is a relatively new thing and a set of behaviors and for this reason, I like to propose that we are all students of open science. So things are going to change as we learn about new practices and we learn about our past. And therefore, I hope that this is um, useful to you, whether you are a student, an educator or a supervisor. So there was a lovely introduction just now about myself, but I thought I would recap just quickly who I am and maybe the way I came into open science, which I think everyone's personal experiences and stories are fascinating here because it gives you an insight about why open science means so much to certain people and how they came to know about it. So I'm a psychology lecturer at Aston University and because of my experiences and background, this talk is mainly going to be focusing on psychology with the examples that I provide. But as, as we go through, you'll see that actually the replication crisis and open science spans across multiple disciplines, both science-based and non-science-based. I have a PhD in experimental social psychology, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second and the challenges that I faced. And because of the experiences in my own PhD, I have a passion for open science and robust and rigorous methodology. So thinking about experimental tasks that can really measure the psychological processes that we're interested in as psychologists and really thinking about the reliability and validity of those tasks. I'm a local network lead of the UK Reproducibility Network. And that means that in my everyday job, I help people with uh, questions they have around open science or their research regimes. But also I do a lot of things under this umbrella of the UKRN, such as running the Reproducibility Journal Club at Aston. I'm a member of the Framework for Open and Reproducible Research Training, otherwise known as FORT for short. And this is an organization that I'd really encourage people to get involved with. They do fantastic pedagogy work around open scholarship and open research, and they're a really friendly and welcoming bunch. And I'm an editor of registered reports for two journals. So I can also answer any questions you might have regarding this publication format or publishing within these journals as well. But who am I really? So I like to call myself a child of the replication crisis. I did my PhD in 2013 to 2016 on the mediators of stereotype threat. And stereotype threat is a social psychological phenomenon whereby knowledge of negative societal stereotypes are proposed to have a detrimental influence on people's performance. So, for example, knowledge of the stereotype that, that women are bad at mathematics um, has in the literature a detrimental effect on women's mathematical performance. And because the literature appears to be so robust and there are many multi-study papers that show significant and very clear um, findings, I jumped in at the deep end of my PhD to look at the underpinning mechanisms or mediators of the stereotype threat performance relationship. And I had a really hard time because I couldn't replicate the typical stereotype threat effects. And this really kind of um, drew out my imposter syndrome and I felt like a failure. I felt like it was me who was designing these really poor studies that couldn't elicit the effects. So I ended up really burning myself out trying to run multiple experiments, trying to find these effects that I just couldn't find. 
And it was around 2015 that I heard about the replication crisis in psychology. And this was really um, coffee door or coffee corridor chats, kind of like the coffee room chats or talks within the corridor where people were hearing about rumblings of a crisis in psychology. And so I started to attend a lot of different talks. And whilst working at Lancaster University, I got involved in an open science working group. And hearing about the crisis answered a lot of questions and actually personal doubts that I had about my own ability, because I realized that I was not the only one going through these difficulties and challenges. And actually, the field was in quite a, a bad state but one that we could fix through open science and open research. And I was lucky in a way in that my PhD supervisor was an addiction researcher. So I was able to change my research field from the focus of social psychology and stereotype threat to applying social psychology to the study of addictive behaviors. And this is why you see kind of two themes running through my research now. But something that was really important to me was to make sure that students do not kind of experience the same feelings that I had. And potentially this could lead to them dropping out of their studies because it's so easy to see things as a personal failure rather than something wider in the field. So I wrote a book so that students hopefully don't go through the same. And this is called A Student's Guide to Open Science using the replication crisis to reform psychology. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the contents of that book and the open science initiatives and behaviours we can implement in our research workflow so that we can improve psychological science. And for me, open science or open research gave me the hope and brought back my passion for psychology in that I feel that we can mitigate the problems that we face within research fields and really recreate a very open, transparent and replicable um, field for, for across, across research fields as well. So I just want to give you an overview of psychology's recent history. So something in the book that I talk about is how we got here. How did we start having this deep reflection that there were problems and difficulties within our field? So in 2005, Ioannidis published a paper that suggested that most published research findings are false. And this sent shockwaves through the academic community because it was something that we might have kind of discussed or thought about ourselves, but the statements within this paper were really powerful and uh, quite shocking. And Ioannidis argues that because of many problems that we see within the scientific literature, such as publication bias, but also researcher degrees of freedom and our analytical flexibility, that actually what we see in the published research literature may not be true. It may not be the robust science and we definitely aren't seeing the inconclusive or the null results. In 2011, in social psychology, a researcher known as Daryl Bem provided evidence of something known as precognition. So Bem published a series of nine experiments in the prestigious journal of Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, showing almost that people could predict their future, so a term known as precognition. And although people knew that precognition was scientifically um, unconvincing, it was it defies the laws and the logics of physics. In this nine study paper. Ben provided very convincing evidence that people could actually predict their future behavior or predict their memories. So this got everybody talking because people were very um, unsettled about how this could be published and where was the negative or inconclusive findings in this multi-study paper. When actually, if the true effect was there, we would still expect to see some inconclusive or null, null findings, and they just weren't there. And in the same year, 
Staples, another social psychologist, was found guilty of academic fraud in multiple papers. And he's actually written about his admissions of this academic fraud in a memoir, in a book. And in the, in the same year, meta-scientists Simmons and colleagues showed how researchers can present anything as significant. So with all the analytical flexibility that we have and the non-transparent reporting, we can actually take a data set that may not be showing us anything and actually present our findings as significant. So as you can imagine, the year of 2011 really got psychologists and the wider field talking and debating the issues that we are seeing in, the, in research. And in 2012, another meta-scientist group, John and colleagues, revealed that researcher questionable research practices are very prevalent within the field. So talks about a crisis then started emerging in a special issue of um, perspectives on psychological science by Pashlet and wagon makers. And they start, started to think about the challenges in the field of psychology and the reasons behind this. But there wasn't up until this um, date much empirical evidence that supported the idea of a replication crisis. In 2014 then, a large-scale collaboration known as Many Labs One published the results of a large-scale replication effort in a special issue on replications of important results in social psychology. And they actually showed that replication success was quite high and replications were successful. But one of the limitations of the Many Labs One studies were that many of the studies were actually selected because they were thought to be replicable. So they weren't randomly sampled and they were known to have been replicated in the past successfully. So there was a little bit of an issue with sampling here. So perhaps one of the most convincing large scale um, collaboration efforts was by the Open Science Collaboration in 2015. And they published results from 100 replications where studies were randomly selected from three top journals in psychology. And they showed a shocking 36% success rate. So with larger samples, higher statistical power, pre-registrations of those analyses, they showed a quite damning success rate of replications in psychology. And in 2016, um, sorry, let me just hide this from the bottom of my screen. So in 2016, Baker then encouraged 1,500 scientists to lift the lid on the crisis. And this showed us that the problems are across research fields. And actually, it wasn't just psychology that was experiencing these challenges. So it's not just psychology's problem. In the paper by Baker, we see that over 52% of psychologists, uh, sorry, of researchers believe that there is a reproducibility crisis. So 52% of 1,500 scientists believe that there was a significant crisis and 38% believe that there was a slight crisis. And when these scientists were asked whether they'd failed to reproduce an experiment, most scientists had experienced failure to reproduce either someone else's results or their own results. So you can see on the right hand side here that chemistry are at the top, followed by biology, physics, medicine. So these problems are indeed not just psychology's problem. So what are the causes of the crisis? So a lot of places when you look to the literature, they might explain certain causes of the crisis but what I felt was missing particularly from a student's perspective was one place that discussed all of these kind of causes or potential explanations. So my book aims to provide an overview of this as well. Now a lot of these causes or explanations are interweaving, they are not independent but here's an example of some. So historically, what we have seen within research is that our academic incentives reward quantity over quality. 
So the metrics look at how many papers have been published rather than the quality of those papers and the robustness of those papers. And esteem really has focused on this quantity metric. Now we're seeing some really positive changes where we're switching the focus now to quality, but historically quantity has definitely been the focus. And this drives really questionable practices due to the pressures that researchers are under to produce lots of different outputs. And within our research, there is bias, bias and more bias. So what I mean by that is that we have personal cognitive biases, such as confirmation bias, that make us look at our data in a certain way and perhaps convince ourselves that an effect is there to be found when actually we may not have found an effect at all. So these are kind of personal level biases. But we also have more structural and higher level biases such as publication bias, where positive or highly influential interesting findings are published at a higher rate compared to inconclusive or null findings within our literature. And what we then find is that our literature provides this really unbalanced and very biased perspective of the phenomenon and the effects that we think we're investigating. We've also got questionable research practices. So the meta research by John and colleagues in 2012 outlined many different questionable research practices that lie in the gray area of not being academic misconduct or fraud, but allow people to mold and shape their data so that it tells them really what they want to, to find or they want to see. So an example, for example, is um, p-hacking. So analyzing your data in multiple different ways to give a significant finding. And we'll look at more QRPs on the next slide as well. There's also been a focus on statistically significant p-values. So again, we've focused more on p-values compared to other statistics such as confidence intervals or effect sizes. And there has been pressure historically to find significant effects, which kind of builds into this questionable research practices and the pressure that we're under to publish in certain journals and to find the things that we expect to find. We've had a history of two small sample sizes. So we've not been very well educated with things like statistical power. Within psychology, there used to be a rule of thumb that 20 or 30 participants per condition was enough, but we didn't ever think about our effect sizes or statistical power, and sometimes not even the alpha levels that we were using. And again, we've come a long way from that, but there has been a history of very small, flimsy sample sizes in our literature. We also see the issue of measurement, measurement. So this is something that um, Flake and colleagues talk a lot about in psychology. And this is how we create measures that we believe have construct validity. But actually, when we dig deeper, reliability is not reported very well. Validity checks are not reported very well. And we don't really focus on creating and improving our measures. We've also favored novelty over replication. So replications in psychology have been very rare and the focus and the incentives have been around these very novel original findings, these blue sky ideas that turn out the way that we expected. Science has not been self-correcting. So as scientists, if we find a mistake in our code, in our analysis, in our final outputs, we should correct that record, particularly given that the general public might use our research and implement it in their daily lives. But what we actually find is that there's a fear or a worry around self-correcting our work. And I argue in my book that actually science has been other correcting. We have been putting the onus on others to correct our mistakes. And finally, we have closed science. So we've not been very transparent. We haven't had 
open research practices in the past and what this has created is a very closed science where people are worried about being scooped or sharing their materials or data, data with others and actually when things happen behind a closed door it's very difficult to then understand exactly how an experiment took place, exactly how analyses were run and the conclusions that were drawn. So I just want to focus in a little bit more about questionable research practices as well. So here you can see that there's a black line at the bottom of the screen that talks about academic fraud. And this is consciously falsifying or fabricating results. And this is well known to be academic, academic misconduct. So if you're guilty of um, conducting academic fraud, you would likely be sacked and not hold an academic position. But at the top of this, just before that kind of um, black line and in the grey area of misconduct are various and numerous QRPs. So, for example, p-hacking, actively seeking significant results, optional stopping, repeatedly analysing the data and deciding when to stop when you've reached statistical significance. Harking, so hypothesizing after results are known. So presenting post hoc hypotheses based on your results as if you had predicted them all along. Selective reporting, so only reporting measures or analyses that worked or tell a good story. Salami slicing, so publishing the results of one study more than once without transparently reporting this. And then publication bias, and I include publication bias as a QRP in itself, because this is a phenomenon where significant results are favoured and published in higher quantities, but it creates this really unbalanced biased literature. And many, many years ago, these practices were arguably normative. People didn't understand the influence that they were having on type one error rates, so false positives. But now, over time, we have learned through meta research and simulations of data that these QRPs can have a hugely influential effect on our results, particularly when multiple QRPs are used together. So let's think about how the replication crisis might have formed. So thinking again about the psychology, uh, sorry, the recent history of the replication crisis and the psychology behind how science should be conducted. So we can take a look at the Mertonian norms here. So science should be communal. It should be about being open and sharing our materials and our results with others. There should be elements of universalism, so evaluating research on its own merit. Disinterestedness, so we should be motivated by knowledge and discovery rather than our own egos. And there should be organised scepticism, so we should update our beliefs based on new evidence. But what we actually find within science and research is secrecy, so this culture of closed science. Particularism. So we tend to evaluate research by reputation or esteem. Self-interestedness. So we treat science as a competition and we tend to compete against each other for research grants, for papers. Organised dogmatism. So we tend to invest in promoting our own work over the work of others. And we seem to be quite self-interested in that manner. Um, by thinking about our own work and not collaborating with larger teams. And overall, what this has kind of led to is on one hand, how science should be, is thinking about the quality of our outputs. So publishing rigorous work, addressing important questions for theories and application. But what we see is quantity. So this publish or perish mentality that we have to have lots of different outputs. So what's good for scientists isn't isn't good for science. And this is one of the ways in which we see the difficulties that we're experiencing today. 
So how can we mitigate these issues? So we, we know now that we're in a replication crisis or a credibility revolution, if you want to think about this more optimistically and positively. But how, I, how might we mitigate the um, issues we see around replication, reproducibility and transparency? So open research provides us with some of the answers here. And open research or open science is an umbrella term that reflects the idea that scientific knowledge of all kinds, where appropriate, should be openly accessible, transparent, rigorous, reproducible, replicable, accumulative and inclusive. And these are all considered fundamental features of the scientific endeavour. So the great thing about open science is that it does not prescribe a specific set of rules, but actually it's a collection of behaviours. And on the right hand side of this slide, you can see some of those behaviours in the open science wheel. So we have things like article preprints, study pre-registration or registered reports, open data and code and open materials, and then collaboration in terms of big team science and meta research. Now, not all practices will be relevant or possible for every piece of your research, and therefore you can decide which are best. And I like to use Christina Bergman's term of the buffet approach to open science. So you can take these practices as though you were going to a buffet and taking some food that you liked on those days. If, for example, preprints work for your um, current research, you can implement that practice. If, for example, registered reports would work, you can implement that practice. But you don't have to do all of these things in one and you can keep going back to that buffet table and taking each new practice and adding this into your toolkit as you progress with your research. And one of the top tips that I would say, which seems really simple, is that when you're thinking about open science and implementing these behaviours, talk to your collaborators and your peers, talk to your ethics board and talk to your librarians about them. So librarians have so much information and detailed knowledge on these practices but I don't feel like we talk to our, to our librarians enough. So you might have a dedicated open research team within your own institutional library. So I want to give you um, some more detail about each of these open science practices and how they might be appropriate or useful for your research. So let's start with preprints. Preprints are a scientific document that's made available freely and legally outside of a traditional publisher through an online internet repository. And what this means is that other people can access your work and read it for free and it's not behind a paywall. And many different journals actually allow you to post a preprint on one of these um, servers such as PsychArchive for psychology, BioArchive for biology, EdArchive for education and MedArchive for medical sciences and these are just a few. But a lot of the journal regulations and guidelines do actually allow you to submit a preprint. So check the guidelines, you can look at Sherpa Romeo to see them, but this is actually a legal thing to do in many respects. So many preprint servers have been around for a very long time, actually. So Arc Archive, a scientific preprint server, celebrated its 30th birthday in 2021 and currently hosts over 2 million preprints in physics, maths and computer science. Psychology, however, founded this um, a lot like a lot sooner. So Psych Archive has only been around since 2016. I think that's quite a fun fact because people believe that preprint servers are very recent, but actually some of them have been along, been around for a very, very long time. So if you're thinking about preprinting your work, you have this finalised manuscript and you've proofread it and it's all clean. How do you go about 
creating a preprint. So you can visit any one of these servers, which is appropriate for your research discipline. And before you make your preprint available, you should check the journal guidelines for where you wish to publish or where the journal might be on, sorry, where the article might be under review, such as looking at the Sherpa Romeo um, website. A top tip is to include a draft date and information about the paper's status on the cover page so that people can see the version, they can see whether it's um, still undergoing revisions or whether it's in press, for example. You can then deposit your preprint on the server of your choice and choose an appropriate license, such as a CCBY. And then a really important top tip is to then update your preprints after any revisions. So don't just leave it as your final working paper, but actually upon revision, make sure that you update your preprint. And the same with any corrections or a retraction, you would need to update your preprint version of that paper as well. And Machant and colleagues in 2021 published a really lovely guide to journal preprints. So I really recommend reading this paper if you're interested in implementing this practice alongside your research. A second open science behaviour or practice is study pre-registration. And study pre-registration refers to a public time-stamped outline of your research questions, hypotheses, methods and analysis prior to data collection and or analysis. So this can actually be initiated for primary data collection where the data has not yet been collected, but also secondary data analysis where you might already have the data, but you've not yet analyzed it. So pre-registration can be applied to any research project, whether that's primary or secondary data, whether that is com confirmatory or exploratory analyses, and also quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods research. And the key goal of pre-registration is to distinguish these confirmatory results or confirmatory hypotheses from exploratory hypotheses. So being very transparent about what you predict and why, and what is your confirmatory analyses and your exploratory analyses. And there's a really nice paper by Brian Nozak and colleagues in 2018 that talks about the pre-registration revolution. So there's lots of templates available on the open science framework, which have varying specificity. And with pre-registration, you're able to make your protocol public immediately or embargo it for a certain amount of time. And you can submit, submit your pre-registration as supplementary material alongside your article for unmasked or masked peer review. So you can actually go into the open science framework and make it private, make sure that you've redacted all author information, or you can leave it identifiable. There is that option. And the most important things with pre-registration is to think of it as a plan and not a prism. So if you have any deviations from your research protocol, which can be very common and happen, you should be really transparent about those deviations and explicitly state them within your article or by updating your pre-registration. So for example, pre-registrations on the OSF now have an update function where you can go back into your protocol and make amendments and explain why you've had to deviate from the initial plan. A really nice way of easing yourself into pre-registration is to look at aspredicted.org. So as predicted is a template for pre-registering your study and it asks eight simple questions about your study. And many of these questions you will have asked yourself and decided upon when thinking about your ethics, so your ethics application around your research. And I just find this a really nice starting point if you've never pre-registered your study before of having a go at, as predicted, which is a lot briefer, and then kind of building yourself up to the more 
detailed and um, specific plans such as the open science framework templates. So as predicted, asks you to answer eight different questions such as what's the main question being asked? What are the key dependent variables? Um, what analyses you'll conduct and how many observations will be collected. So if you can answer these questions before you set out to do your study, you can do a pre-registration. And then the gold standard of pre-registration is registered reports. And this is a publication format where the typical article is split into two stages. So it's stage one, you write your introduction, your methods and analysis, and you submit this for review to a journal that, that accepts registered reports before data collection and or analysis. The stage one protocol is then peer reviewed. And if the reviewers and editors are happy with your protocol, you are given something known as in principle acceptance or IPA for short. And this is where the journal guarantees to publish regardless of the results, so long as you have followed your accepted protocol. At stage two, you then go out and collect or analyze your data and you write your final report and append your results and discussion onto your stage one protocol. The editors then assess and the reviewers assess are the conclusions based on the evidence. And registered reports therefore flip the focus away from the results and how interesting they are to methodological rigor and accurate reporting. So actually, whether you've got positive, null or in, uh, inconclusive results doesn't matter anymore. You can see some examples of stage one and stage two registered reports on the OSF registries site. So I suggest checking these out if you're interested in submitting a registered report. And I wanted to mention a new platform known as Peer Community In Registered Reports. And this is a centralized platform where you can submit a stage one and stage two preprint registered report that is then evaluated and reviewed by expert reviewers and editors in the field. But the difference here is that you are not tied to a journal. So upon getting in principle acceptance and then final acceptance of your stage two article, you can then choose to publish with a list of ever growing PCI friendly journals. So this means that you don't have to choose a journal from day one. You can go through this centralized process of experts, have your registered report approved, and then you have the choice of submitting to the journal where you feel your article or your research best suits or best fits. And then we've got open materials and code. So open materials refer to making your experimental tasks or questionnaires publicly available. And again, the Open Science Framework provides a platform where you can disseminate your scripts, your interviews, um, your data. But another top tip is just to check the copyright if, for example, your materials are not developed by yourself. So there are some experimental stimuli, for example, that do have copyright licenses attached to them. You can also upload supplementary text or readme files if you're using software that's not open source, such as MATLAB. And this just allows others to then reproduce your results without having access to that proprietary software. You can also upload your analysis and visualization code. So for example, RStudio, aids reproducibility, but actually point and click software such as SPSS or JASP can also be uploaded in a reproducible way. Thinking about open data then, data available on request doesn't aid meta-analyses or replication by others, but sharing anonymized data on a public repository does. Creating open data and sharing open data 
does include forethought on the front end for your ethics and at the back end for organisation. So really thinking about making sure it's detailed and transparent and other people can understand it. To aid this, you can provide a data dictionary or a code book, allowing for the data to be um, understandable and therefore useful to others. And you can apply a CCBY license to the data set so that people are obligated to cite the data or attribute it to you, which is one of the concerns or barriers that people have reported about open data. OK, so there's a summary of certain open research practices that you can implement in your work. But why is it important to engage in open science? So open science is simply good science, and there are numerous unselfish reasons to adopt these practices. They allow us to disseminate reliable and robust information. They increase trust in research. It means that we're not gatekeeping knowledge. It helps others to use and build on research products, ensure that mistakes can be identified, and allow other readers to properly evaluate research. But there's also many selfish benefits of open science. Preprints, for example, allow you to disseminate your work and get early feedback, and they're associated with more citations. Pre-registration allows you to better plan your research and make it better from the get-go rather than discovering mistakes as you go along. Materials, code and data allow you to future-proof your work so no longer can you have the excuse that the dog ate your homework. And registered reports are empirically perceived as being more rigorous. And there's emerging evidence that supports these different reasons as well. So pre-registration has been found to reduce or make transparent outcome switching and selective reporting and reduces publication bias by aiding discoverability. For registered reports, what we find from the standard literature is that hypotheses are five times more likely to be unsupported in registered reports compared to the traditional literature. So publication bias in psychology, for example, is estimated at around 96% for the traditional literature but these positive findings are 42.7% in registered reports. Registered reports are well cited. They are at or above their respective journal impact factor. And research has shown that they enhance perceptions of quality without any change in perceptions of novelty. So I'm very cautious about time and I do want us to have a discussion about these different practices and how we might embed them into teaching. So I'm just going to give you one example here and then I'm going to open the floor to questions. But it's really important to embed open science into teaching and into pedagogy. If we want our research disciplines to improve, then we have to also train our students in these practices. And you might wish to do this through formal taught lectures or seminars or assessments, but you can also embed open science into student projects such as running replication projects or consortiums. Within research training, you can support students, whether they are undergraduate at an MSc level or at PhD level to pre-register their work and to submit via the registered reports format. So I just want to give you one quick case study and then I'll conclude and I'll share my slides. But for example, when we look at student projects, Krishna and Peter showed that there are many questionable research practices within students' projects as well. So 28% of students admit to engaging in selective reporting. 15.5% reported that they excluded data after seeing the effect on the findings, and 15% hypothesised after knowing their results. And this is with self-reports as well, so people being worried about actually admitting to these practices. 
And these QRPs were predicted by um, supervisors' attitudes. And in 2017, O'Boyle and colleagues found that ugly initial results in students' dissertations can metamorphosize into beautiful publications, such as outcome switching, negative findings becoming positive, null findings becoming significant. And we know that student projects are limited by time, money and resources. And we tend to focus our assessment criteria still on novelty, creativity and individual contributions. And this exacerbates the problems we see previously in our wider literature. Small, underpowered studies, a lack of replication, reproducibility, poor designs and undisclosed flexibility. So a solution to this is to improve our methodological training and to collaborate in big team science through undergraduate and postgraduate research training. And this is not a new idea. So Kate But Button has uh, written a lot of papers around this that you can access here. And myself and colleagues have also um, written papers on this. But the way that this looks is that you work in a team where students provide their individual contributions through the research questions they ask. But you then work as a team to pool data, to collect data and to um, think about individual expertise and implementing that within the project. And such consortium projects can also be done as registered reports too. So we know that our students enjoy these collaborative large scale projects. So we found that they aid their clarity and organization. They reduce bias and they improve their perceptions of rigor and integrity. But there are some challenges as well. So in the interest of time, I do want to allow people to ask some questions. So I'm just going to skip a couple of slides and then open the room to questions as well. So to conclude, open science is simply transparent science and there's many unselfish reasons such as disseminating reliable information, increasing trust, not being gatekeepers and saving resources. The selfish reasons to implement open science is that it helps with project organisation, long term efficiency and it facilitates collaboration. So like others, I advocate for a finding your feet approach with open science, selecting what feels comfortable for you and adding these practices and behaviours to your toolkit over time. There's some resources for you here and I'll open the room now to any questions we might have. Thank you very much, Charlotte. It was a really nice uh, and interesting uh, talk uh, you, you did. Uh, and I find that uh, you give an, an exhaustive overview of the replicability and reproducibility revolutions, uh, discussing uh, the its causes and uh, its solutions. So it was really, really good. I find it really, really Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Thank you very much. So let's start our Q&A session. If you please let me remember that to you, that if you want to um, ask a question, you can raise your hand and uh, speak it out loud. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can uh, send it, uh, uh, send your question into the chat uh, where you can find some indication on how to ask questions. So does anyone have a question? Okay, Christina, thank you. Oops, sorry. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. It was really, I think, a very, very useful um, presentation as also Michaela just said. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, you said you began your journey in open science while, while you were already in your, enrolled in your uh, PhD, right? And uh, now you, uh, you, of course, of course, you are an enthusiast of it, and I share this with you. But I was wondering, in your opinion and from your experience, how much 
uh, how much more effort does it take to be open to do open science and if it does of course and then uh, what are your your suggestions for younger people to begin this journey because i i liked the metaphor of uh, the buffet the yeah open science buffet but uh, do you have also more specific or uh, yeah different suggestions for for them yeah, that's a great question, Christina. Thank you. So I learned about the replication crisis during my PhD. So I was actually thinking of not going into a research career because of the challenges that I'd faced. And I had endorsed those as being about my own ability. And then it was around the end of my PhD when I joined Lancaster as a teaching associate. I wanted to focus on teaching for a little bit and, and rethink my research. And it was there where I got involved in open research. So if it wasn't for open research and open research role models, I'm not actually sure whether I'd still have, still be in, a, in an academic career. So I do feel like open science gave me that passion and the answer to many of the challenges that we see. To answer your question about, does it take more effort? Does it take more time? I'll be completely truthful and say yes, because it gets you to think more. So, for example, if you implement a pre-registration, you have to sit down at the start of your research and really think, OK, what are my hypotheses? How am I going to robustly design an experiment or a research study that tests my research questions? What are the analysis plans that I have? And actually, and this really surprises me today and it surprises many others, when I did my PhD, I would go out and conduct studies, collect all the data, and then I'd sit down with my supervisors and ask how we analysed it. So we would never think from the start, how do we analyse this data? We, we hadn't really discussed that. And so with pre-registration, it forces you to think these questions through. But actually, all you're doing really is displacing that time. So the time spent at the forefront would have been somewhere else in the research process anyway. You're just me moving it to the start. So with that practice, it can feel a little bit frustrating when you just want to get out and start collecting data immediately. But when you think through all these questions and answer them, you start seeing holes in your design or potential um, barriers or mistakes that you might make along the way. So I have found that the quality of my research has, it, has been enhanced quite exponentially by implementing these practices. So at the cost of time, you get better science, not, for the pe not just for the people reading it and for the, for the public, but also for your own incentives as well, such as when papers are evaluated by um, research excellence frameworks and, and the kind of things that we have to do in our job, you tend to find that the open science practices are valued there and are scored very highly in robustness, in reproducibility, in rigour. So actually, um, yes, it takes more time and effort, but the gains from that, I feel completely outweigh any limitations of that as well. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, also, if you have um, some specific suggestions, may maybe based on your uh, experience. Uh, OK, I mean, uh, I totally agree. You said uh, it's a buffet. Think about what is most useful for you. But uh, think that like I'm uh, a very young researcher and I don't know how to uh, how to begin with where to begin. Uh, yes. what you tell me to do so it can be very daunting as well and this is why I say don't feel like on day one you have to implement all of these open research practices because you will you will get overwhelmed by them but instead think about your research and what might be appropriate or suitable for you first and kind of take baby steps into the bigger practices so, for example, you might start with sharing a preprint of your first paper and then realising that that's not as scary as it might seem and you get useful feedback and people aren't critiquing you in a horrible manner. 
And then you might feel like, okay, I'd like to have a go at pre-registration, but I'm not too sure where to start. So you could start with, for example, the as predicted template, which is the eight questions. It's very short. And then building up to, let's say, an open science pre-registration or a registered report. And the same with your um, kind of open materials and code and data. As time goes by, you can start adding those skills into your skill set. So again, something that was really beneficial for me was to sit down with my data and to make a code book because then I can understand that data in five years time. If I ever need to see it again, I understand it. And by doing that, I then was able to share it because I felt like, well, I've done all this work now. I might as well share it with others. So again, I would just say, slowly, slowly try practices don't be worried about getting things wrong. So my first pre-registration compared to my pre-registrations now is abysmal, but I was trying my best at the time and I was learning. So again, making these incremental steps, learning from any mistakes, not being afraid to make those mistakes in the first place. And then hopefully it will ease you into open science practices. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Charlotte. We have uh, a question from the chat. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, do you have any data about the number of pre-registration reports in biomedical field? I have the feeling that scientists are not too, so open to pre-register their project. And uh, also added that I'm engaging training PhD students and senior to change their way to organize their project from the beginning, but it's our job. OK, so I'll ask the second question again. But for the first question, I'm not fully aware of that um, because I tend to still stay in my psychology silo. However, um, myself and my collaborator, Emma Norris, have just done a large scale survey on open research practices. So thinking about awareness and uptake of these different open research practices. And this was in the UK, but we are doing this internationally now as well. And what we find is that awareness of things like pre-registration and registered reports are quite good, but they're not implemented as much as we might like to see them in the literature. There's two ways of thinking about this. One is the pessimistic way. We're not at a ceiling level of seeing pre-registration and open data and things like this, and therefore there needs to be improvements. But the optimistic way of thinking about this is that open research practices are still relatively new and we've seen a huge uptick of their implementation within the literature. So it's going to take time for these practices to trickle down and for our incentive structures to catch up, such as editorial policies, hiring, promotion criteria, these kind of things. But we are seeing really positive trends in the open research space that these things are happening. So hopefully over time, we will see um, an increase in these practices such as pre-registration. So I know that doesn't fully answer your question, but hopefully what you're seeing in your in your own discipline as well is that there are in, there is an increase in these practices over time. They're not just staying at a certain level. And then would you be able to repeat the second question? I didn't quite catch it. So basically that uh, for some uh, it's difficult to get the senior researcher to uh, start with uh, open science practices. So possibly you can say about, uh, you can say something about uh, how to deal with that, uh, that kind of situation, yeah. which I believe Absolutely. that is relatable uh, to, to many. <laughs> yeah. So I find it quite helpful to put myself in the shoes or think about the perspective of senior researchers. They have always done science a certain way and they've been rewarded for doing science in that way. And if you then tell them to change their behaviour and everything's now changed, they might be reluctant to change because they're incentive driven in the old system. But they might also be really worried about change. I think all of us as humans, if we're told to do something differently or implement a brand new practice that we have no experience with, that can be a barrier in itself because we're 
we're worried about that or we may be even scared of implementing those practices. So I think talking to senior colleagues about what are your concerns, what are the barriers, realising that a lot of the concerns that are reported are actually unfounded. So for example, senior academics might say, I don't want to uh, pre-register my work because I'm worried about being scooped. Someone might take that idea and it's my idea and actually explaining to them, okay, well, you can um, put an embargo on that pre-registration. You can keep it private until you're ready. It might actually increase the quality of your work and the evaluation of that work. So trying to dig down into what are the challenges and their concerns to see whether they are reality or not um and then i think just speaking about it a lot so it sounds silly but i tend to shout these things from the rooftops and over time by talking to people and asking them questions i found some people to go from completely i don't want to implement open science to now running their labs around open science so it it can be done It, it just takes a little time with some people And I think the optimistic thing is that if we train our grassroots, they're going to be the next generation of researchers. And if they're trained in reproducibility and replication, then over time, we're just going to um, kind of reinstate our different values, our ethos and change the way that science is done. So it's, it's about kind of knocking it down and starting again as well sometimes. Thank you very much. Okay, so I believe it's, uh, if there is no other question from the audience, I believe we have j- just the last minute to say some uh, closing words. So let me first uh, thank you, Charlotte, again, for uh, being here today and uh, sharing all this uh, information with us. Uh, it was uh, it it was really really helpful and uh, hope uh, and I hope that uh, more people today are uh, consider started considering the idea to dig into open science uh, and open science practices. So thank you very much again. Um, last uh, words I would uh, uh, say to our audience is that. Uh, For those uh, who ask for the certificate of attendance of this seminar, we'll uh, receive uh, the certificate by email in the next uh, seven days. Uh, Another uh, important information I will share to you is that uh, uh, shortly next week, we have our second seminar uh, um, on open science, uh, which will be on uh, Wednesday 6th at 3 p.m. And uh, we uh, will welcome a co-fried, which is going to talk uh, about the questionable measurement practices and how to deal with them. And uh, also remember to uh, stay updated with our initiatives and content uh, by uh, subscribing to the ETR and and also subscribing to our YouTube channel. So thank you again and uh, good afternoon, everybody. (laughs)